it's the, the if you if you actually lower the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, it will come out of the ocean. So that there is that, that I, I believe that's the effect that you're referring to. But it does have to be done on on a pretty massive scale. But the, the, it, it is it is quite easy to make the wrong calculations uh, unless you understand the dynamics of it. Uh, okay, uh, thank you very much, uh, Matt. We uh, will now move to the discussion part of this session. If I could have the panel uh, panelists come to the front while I just say a few words here. So we have uh, roughly one hour. Um, I don't know about you, but uh, when I um, opened the summary for policymakers of this report, the ocean and the cryosphere, um, I thought actually this is probably the most depressing report that I have read of all times, including all the IPCC report. And the reason is because unlike the land, it's a lot more difficult to directly manage the ocean, whereas on land you have options, you have, uh, you have uh, opportunities, you have co-benefits, you all have all kinds of things that are more or less evident. And on the ocean, it's a lot more difficult. And as a result, I think the key message, number one, which has been understood very well, is that we do need to actually reduce emissions to uh, lower the risk as much as possible. And this is the number one action you can do. Uh, but from an ocean perspective, it leaves you a little bit um, sort of without any uh, uh, opportunities or a for action. And therefore, the panel discussion today will be mostly about action, in fact. We've gotten uh, three uh, experts uh, who do uh, action on the ground and who have certainly a lot of insights on how this um, can uh, operate. Uh, we have three panelists. I'll start with uh, Melanie. I'll introduce them one at a time, maybe give you a few minutes to say your few key points, and then I'll move on to the next one. So uh, Melanie uh, Austin is uh, head of science at PML, the Plymouth, Plymouth Marine uh, Laboratory, where she leads the sea and society area of interdisciplinary marine science. So uh, Mel, uh, over to you for a few points, including additional points on your biography, if you wish to. Okay, um, I take the world from quite a strongly natural capital approach. Um, so one of my roles is sitting on the natural capital committee. So that means we need to try and balance things uh, out. So I'm kind of really concerned that you know, the IPCC reports, the SROC report says about fisheries changing. Um, what does that mean for us in terms of food security? Uh, it probably means that we shouldn't all become pescatarians as was advocated this morning. Uh, but that's, that's a sort of, there's an issue there about our diets. Um, there's also an issue about livelihoods, so the livelihoods of, of people who are engaged in, in marine activities are going to change because the fish and the species they catch are going to change. Um, that's, that's of some importance in the UK, it's of massive importance in, in developing countries where I also work in Southeast Asia, um, which are heavily dependent on, on fisheries and, and food from the sea. Uh, for, their main, for their main nutritional um, components of their diet. So there are some real issues there about trying to protect and support those people. Uh, so we, we need to sort of think a lot more about not only, as Corinne says, you know, influencing people to, to sort of take on the net, net zero you know, targets, to actually try and do something right now, but to actually support those people in the future, particularly in developing countries, to anticipate what their needs are and to get them thinking about what's going to happen in the future, which is really hard when you're just living on a day-to-day -day basis, just trying to survive. But actually trying to think, well, actually the fisheries are going to change in the future. Uh, all the other things are going to change. It's going to become a lot hotter. The sea level is going to rise. Um, and they have to deal with all of that as well. So there's, there's quite a sort of... One of the things that we can do, one of the actions, is to try and support those people in those countries. And, um, and that, that's actually written quite large into the Royal Society report that uh, Corinne talked about, is thinking about what can we do with our marine systems so that we can actually provide a little bit more resilience to the communities that are affected by climate change. Um, there's also the sea level rise uh, issue. And there, are going to be, there is going to be sea level rise, that has been talked about, it's baked into the system. 
And we need to think about, well, what do we want to hold the line against? Where, where do we actually want to sort of protect and say, actually, we, we've got to protect this. We've got to build sea defences. We, we've got to protect things, power plants, railway lines. I know we don't need railway lines. We didn't need it in the southwest, so why would we have railway lines? Um, housing, all the sort of infrastructure we have to think about. What do we want to protect? What are we going to have to adapt with on sea level rise? And, and what are we going to say, well, these are areas where we should be thinking about managed retreat, uh, realignment of our coast. And that is not only just in the UK, but it's obviously also, again, in, in these developing countries where we need to help. Certainly, we need to have sort of flexible adaptation policies. Again, what you heard in the talks this morning is that there's a lot of uncertainty, even now in marine. Uh, we're not sure of the best ways to adapt. So we have to keep reviewing it and keep thinking about what are the best adaptation policies that we can have. And I think, again, it came out this morning talking about coordination between government departments. We actually need to coordinate our efforts and our actions sort of in the UK and all of those who are involved in the marine environment and the marine governance, transport, uh, shipping, infrastructure at the shore, but also overseas in, in the developing countries as well. Um, and finally, just one thing I'd like to sort of add um, is, is it was fascinating for me to listen and talk to the talks this morning. There is also the interchange, and I'm not sure that it really comes out in the SROC, sports, uh, SROC reports about the interchange between land and sea. So some of that as those adaptations are going to affect the marine environment. So if we change farming practices, agricultural practices, uh, reduce sediment runoff, reduce those nitrogen emissions, then actually those can be quite beneficial in the marine environment, particularly in coastal waters. So we also need to think about those interchanges and those interactions that might also help us to adapt a little bit. Uh, thank you, Emil. Um, can I come back to the same question I asked one of the speakers this morning about the adap adaptation of the ecosystems themselves? So around the UK, is it the case that if we have more sustainable management of the of the seas that the ecosystems would recover, would adapt, and we could have a healthy ecosystems in the sort of nearish future? Uh, yes. Um, <laughs> we've, we've got an increase in marine protected areas and marine conservation zones in the UK and globally, and they're all undoubtedly going to have uh, an effect on actually sort of some of that absorption of carbon. There's a massive amount of... Um, disturbance of the seabed where a lot of carbon is subducted. I mean, I, I think there's growing evidence, not, su not sufficient for IPCC yet, but there is growing evidence that a lot of the kelp is actually exported offshore, potentially subducted into the seabed. Um, and it doesn't really help if, if we keep fishing it back up again or disturbing the seabed. So greater protection over larger swathes of the seabed from those sort of things, taking into account not just what are we extracting in terms of food, but also what other ecosystem services are we protecting, and what are the trade-offs between those, those extractive um, activities and the other benefits we might get from the sea. I think we need to take a lot more account of that because I think it will be beneficial for people who need to adapt to climate change, um, but also for the ecosystems. Thank you, thank you for that. Um, let's move on to the second member of our panel, Dr. Andrew Russell. Uh, Dr. Russell is a senior science and policy analyst at the Committee on Climate Change, where he uh, works particularly on flooding and coastal changes. So, Andrew, up to you. Thank you. Um, yes, yeah, so the, the responsibilities of the Committee on Climate Change are to provide um, independent advice to, to government and also to um, assess progress being made by government towards uh, climate change in mitigation and adaptation. Uh, because we're approaching an election, I'm not allowed to say anything about uh, that second part of our remit on the uh, assessment of policies. But if you are interested, have a look at our progress report, and it's pretty well summed up in the first sentence. Um, so on the, the, the other part of our remit, um, uh, the climate change risk assessment has already been mentioned today, and we, we play a large part in that in uh, convening the evidence report. And from the, the CCRA from 2017, um, the, the future of coastal communities in the UK was a, a big concern. So we, we dived a little deeper on that uh, last year. We published a report um, looking at how, how to manage 
the English coast in a, a changing com uh, climate. So our, our starting point was largely that uh, a one meter sea level rise is pretty much inevitable at some point in the future. We didn't necessarily put a, a, a date on that, but I think it's well within the lifespan of, of most towns and, and communities that probably exist on the, the coast at the moment. Um, and then, then went from that point. Um, so we, we have a lot of uh, assets exposed on the coast. Around half a million properties uh, face a one in 200 year risk of flooding at the moment. And we expect that to be around 1.5 million by the end of the century. Um, coastal erosion, uh, properties at risk from coastal erosion is a bit harder to, to pin down, but it's around 9,000 properties at the moment and could be as high as 200,000 by the end of the century, depending on the climate scenario and, and the way that coasts retreat, which we, we're not particularly confident about. Um, so with, with that uh, level of exposure, we, we developed a series of um, recommendations for government, um, and Melanie uh, uh, covered uh, the, the, <laughs> the, 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 the overview of that. So um, just to reiterate that, we, we thought there were these, these areas where it made a strong, where there was a strong socioeconomic case to defend them, and there there should be a, a strong commitment to that defense and development of those areas. Um, at the other end of the scale, there are areas where there would be a, a big benefit to restoring um, natural environments from a, a natural flood management perspective, from a natural capital perspective, and from, from other perspectives that we don't value particularly well at the moment. So if you look at the uh, algorithm to calculate how funds are uh, allocated for flood defenses, if your scheme has a, a particularly big uh, impact on the natural environment, you don't get much um, credit for that. So that would be a useful way to expand coastal adaptation towards more natural responses. And then there's the third category where we, we need to take difficult decisions. So this is where the hazard is either now or in the future likely to be significant, but the assets that are going to be uh, impacted are much less significant. So there, uh, that's the sort of situation where we'll have to engage with communities and understand how to move um, forward with uh, potentially decommissioning um, villages and towns like Fairbourn in Wales is currently going through. Um, and that, that brings me to my final point where for that approach, we really do need to be engaging and um, bringing communities and people on board with what the future of their communities look like. Um, but on the flip side of that, I think there's also a, a good opportunity to engage people in understanding climate change. When we launched the Coastal Report, we had a huge amount of engagement and press coverage um, from all around the coast. I think people really define part of their um, you know, sense of being from our coastal communities. So that, that was a, a, a big opportunity there that I think we could um, capitalize more on in the future, that, that people are very interested in the coast and it is one of the first places that we will see change um, with the climate changes that we're, we're going to have to engage with in the future. Thank you, uh, Andrew. There, um, there are multiple ways to protect the coast. Uh, one is nature-based solution and one is hub walls um, is where are we with this so is there is it one or the other who decides in this dynamics you, you uh, so I, I think with the um, the funding algorithm I mentioned earlier that mm -hmm. that does it, it is easier to um, drop hard infrastructure type defense schemes into that algorithm you know if it's a big engineering project defending a lot of properties and that works very well for acquiring government funding. Um, and, and this is why I was saying we need to value other aspects of natural processes and of coastal defenses more so that we can um, see more management of natural environments at the coast and really value all the, 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 the positives that we can get from those approaches. Okay, thank you. Uh, we'll move uh, to the last uh, panelist. Uh, 
uh, Jane Rumble is uh, head of Polar Region Department at the Foreign and Commonwealth Office, FCO. Uh, she, is, uh, she leads on all Antarctic issues uh, for the UK governments and oversees the UK engagement with the Arctic Council. Jane. Okay, thank you very much, and uh, thank you for inviting me. <clears throat> so, uh, as Corinne had just said, our main role is uh, polar. Uh, so I'll just speak briefly about what we do. Uh, in the south, uh, the Foreign Office has full responsibility for all uh, Antarctic issues, um, which basically means that uh, if you want to pursue your um, ice harvesting entrepreneurial uh, ambitions, um, you need to persuade the Foreign Secretary that it's a good idea and you need to get a permit. Uh, so we look after all UK activities in the Antarctic, um, mainly re relating to uh, what British nationals are up to, but effectively just to keep it peaceful. Um, the changes in the Antarctic, though, kind of really determine the sort of the use of Antarctica. So science is one of the main uses. The other use is tourism. And the final use really is fishing, both of those heavily impacted by changes in Antarctica. But the, the Antarctic Treaty, which uh, looks after the Antarctic and makes us sort of govern it for international purposes, um, is really about governing the Antarctic for the Antarctic. So a lot of what you've been talking about is what is the Antarctic telling us about what's happening in the rest of the world? Uh, so we really only worry about it from what it means for Antarctica and facilitating that kind of dialogue. So all things Antarctica. Uh, in the Arctic, we represent the UK at the Arctic Council, which is a, a group of um, uh, ministers um, set up with the eight Arctic states, again, predominantly to uh, cooperate peacefully. Uh, they are, um, the Arctic Council, however, uh, undertakes a lot of assessments and actually the Arctic Climate Impact Assessment of 2004 uh, was one of the biggest, um, sort of first big international climate reports, really put the Arctic on the map, made the Arctic quite interesting. It gave a list of kind of 10 key things that were changing in the Arctic and that's kind of continued now and of course the changes in the Arctic are possibly even more profound than the Antarctic. Um, because we do kind of environmental ocean stuff, uh, we're also responsible for delivering the blue belt of marine protection around the British overseas territories. Uh, so that should, touch wood, uh, by Christmas, maybe just after, deliver us 4 million square kilometers of protected ocean around our overseas territories out of a total of 6.8 million uh, UK waters. Uh, so in that context, we have a lot of discussion about um, the sort of climate resilience of protection and whether protection uh, needs to be a complete um, reduction of all human activities and any kind of extraction or the extent to which you can still maintain a sustainable blue economy whilst also providing for climate resilience. Um, I think I'll probably, well actually I will mention um, in terms of the ESRIC report more specifically, uh, since it was published uh, I attended the Commission for the Conservation of Antarctic Marine Living Resources which is the bit of the Antarctic Treaty that looks after the Southern Ocean predominantly so we can all scrap about how much fish we're going to catch. Uh, we, uh, as the UK, presented uh, a paper that we wrote with the Grantham Institute, which you can get a copy of at the back, actually, about what the Antarctic Peninsula looks like in a 1.5 degree warmed world, uh, mainly as a hook because the deadline for submitting papers was prior to the publication of the SROC, but we wanted to be able to give a platform for us to speak about it. Uh, so it was quite interesting how the international community outside of the IPCC organizations received this, uh, which I have to say was interesting. Um, particularly uh, Japan and China denied that the Antarctic was warming at all. Um, the Americans said that they could only acknowledge, well, they couldn't acknowledge, they could note it that it existed, but no more than that. Um, uh, and then China said that we couldn't consider it yet in Kamala because their scientists who look after fish hadn't studied it, so they couldn't confirm its validity. Um, consequently, we didn't get it endorsed uh, or acknowledged, uh, which is of concern because, of course, it says a lot about the Southern Ocean. Uh, it says a lot about the way that we should govern the Southern Ocean. And from our perspective, we'd like it to say, or we'd like to use it to indicate that we need to get better marine protected areas in the Southern Ocean. So as the first kind of outing of it that I've been involved in, um, that was quite interesting. The Arctic Council is actually meeting this week, and I'm more optimistic that they'll say something, although they still have our American friends. Um, in that forum, but of course it will go to the COP meeting, which will now be in Madrid in a few weeks' time, so I hope it will start to get picked up uh, more broadly. Thanks. Uh, thank you, thank you. I, I, I love the noted word when all scientists do all this work and the end is noted. Tick. 
Uh, just one question before we go to, uh, uh, to, the, to the room here. Um, is global governance, is that fit for purpose, you think? Well, that, that's a pretty open question. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, I think the multilateral regime generally in any context is, is finding life more challenging. I think as, as you sort of get to the hard end of you know, how many people there are on the planet, the implications of climate change, the fact that we need to squash up uh, we're using most of the land. I think, I think it's, it's, it's definitely getting more pressured. And I think you see climate change really triggers that, especially because it, it sort of panics people when you're talking to countries who are going to lose a significant amount of their land. Mm -hmm. um, so I think, uh, I think it's stress, but I don't, I personally am not sure what you would do instead unless, mm -hmm. you know, we... Yeah, we, that is the problem, isn't it? You may be the president yeah. of the world, but uh, <laughs> um, yeah. yeah, I think we just have to work at it. But it's certainly a challenge. Thank you. Uh, thanks to our panelists. We'll now open the floor for interventions and questions. We'll take a few at the time and then ask the panel to uh, come back on the, the points. Um, yeah, there's one in the back here. We'll take two or three at least. Hi, thank you very much. Um, in Scotland, we have the Scottish Blue Carbon Forum, which is building the evidence base for our understanding of blue carbon. But do you think that we will struggle to get action on that because it's not really accounted for in greenhouse gas targets? Um, there, was, there has been some discussion this morning about financial uh, incentives. So I think it would be good to have the views from the panel to see what needs to be put in place, perhaps to promote uh, more nature-based solutions that have better incentives than perhaps large engineering programs that are more tangible and sexy from, from a short period of time for policymakers, but maybe not so sustainable or beneficial for the ecosystem in the long term. Thank you. Anything else for now? Yeah, there's uh, one here in the front. bit more of a topical question. How would you advise the mayor of Venice? <laughs> so this goes on the web afterwards, right? So he might listen to the track. Uh, advice to the mayor of Venice, very good. Anything else for now? Yeah, there's one here. Thank you, I'm just wondering what what is the what are the various opinions on the locked in this how how much time if we stopped emitting carbon tomorrow how much time would there be left between you get it <laughs> that might be one for our panel uh, our speakers here in fact or maybe andrew if you have an answer don't hesitate we'll go to the panel now and uh, come back for uh, another two or three rounds uh, who wants to make a start the Scottish blue carbon, yeah, Melanie. Okay, I think, I think the blue carbon is a really interesting one, and it, and it actually goes in with the financial in incentives question in, in my head. The, the two are quite linked, actually. Yeah. So when we talk about blue carbon, um, I think, uh, as Phil sort of alluded to, the, the SROC effectively says, uh, however much we do in terms of blue carbon, we're probably just going to be assisting uh, in a reduction of carbon, but it's, it's certainly not the, the be-all and end-all. However, it does have lots of other beneficial effects, uh, as well as carbon sequestration or potential carbon sequestration. It's a sort of whole nursery area for, for juvenile fisheries, um, good for sort of birds and for other species, and potentially, depending on where it is and what it is, uh, for flood defence. So I think, uh, and, and hazard, it, you know, uh, amelioration of extreme hazardous sort of events like floods and storms and, and storm damage. So I think um, just from those points alone, I think it, it needs traction. And I think this is where I do sort of slightly feel that we, we, we kind of have to realize that in ad adapting, we're creating solutions uh, for a wider thing than just carbon adapta adaptation when we talk about blue carbon. And that's, that's really important. 
The reason why I think that links to financial incentives is that I'm one of these people who's also been trying to get my head around financial incentives and how we use them. And I think the, the difficulty we have is that those who are involved in financial incentives are thinking in terms of multi-million blue bond things. Uh, well, not multi-million, that's, 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 that's chicken feed. They're talking about billion pound dollar scale things. And if you're in, in, in the business of trying to think about, well, how do I get this blue carbon initiative off the ground? How do we get some mangroves here and some mangroves there, uh, potentially enhance seagrass beds? You know, you're thinking in terms of, you know, hundreds, 200,000, 300,000. You're, you're trying to push it up to, to half a million. And how do you reach these people who've got these, these sort of billion dollar funds? And I think that's the difficulty is we need some more kind of brokerage that comes at somewhere in the, the intermediate level that sort of actually works out how can you stitch all of these different things that you could do and make them add up to a billion dollars. That's, that's, I think, one of the issues about how we get to financing because I think there is financing out there. It's just I don't think many of us actually know how to get there. And I'm going to throw in, I'm not going to say anything about the mayor of Venice um, because I wouldn't presume to advise him because I don't really know much about how I could advise him on things like that and I think others can talk in about long t lo locked in just in terms of just put it out there in terms of multilateral agreements the question that you asked sorry I'm going to just sort of blast in here we've got IPCC and our IPBES IPBES Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services which was alluded to this morning we also got the convention for biodiversity coming up we've got three conventions that are all roughly kind of sharing some of those goals. There are, there, are, there are so many overlaps. And I do worry that we have three sets of multilateral agreements that, that have quite a lot of complementarities and synergies, and maybe I wonder if we can make better use of those. So that would probably be a question for you as well. Very good. Andrew, would you dare advising the mayor of uh, Venice yourself? I think I'd have to insist on a fairly long fact-finding mission <laughs> first, once the floodwaters have gone down. Um, maybe on the, on the locked-in question, um, I, mean, I think even with the small amount of sea level rise we've seen over the last few decades and what we're, we're, we're due to see in the future, uh, even if there is some remarkable global net zero um, push, uh, in the next few years, uh, th there's still considerable increases in risk that need to be addressed. So I don't think we're going to get out of jail free on that one. Yeah. Okay. Can you elaborate, Matt, a little on that? Uh... <laughs> um, <laughs> Well, no, I, I, I think the, the nature of the impact is, is different to the problem that we're talking about. These long-term, slow, linear problems, I suppose you can view as a chronic issue where we're making um, problems more likely and more severe when they do happen, but predicting when the acute events occur that are going to do the damage. Um, yeah, I, I don't think it matters. It could be this year, it could be... 20 years, who knows? I mean, it, it's not because we're scientifically dodging the issue. Um, you know, what, what the, the expression is predictions uh, of the... No, I can't get the expression right now, so I won't say it. Yeah, so predictions are hard to make, especially about the future. Um, that is because we don't really know the trajectory of greenhouse gas emissions, which depends a lot on people and all these global agreements. So these are the things that we don't tend to, you know, we have to make assumptions about when we do our model um, simulations, because if we tried to cover off all bases, um, we'd be doing a hell of a lot of um, um, supercomputing. Um, so it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a question of the, what we call the boundary conditions or the, the, the future um, emissions of greenhouse gases, which are the problem here, not really the, the science of sea level rise. Yeah, I mean, if I could add a few points as well here, I mean, sea level rise is dependent on, uh, well, it is caused by the ocean expanding and ice melting, not the ice on the sea, but the ice on the continent. And the balance of this depends on the future trajectory of the greenhouse gases. Also, there are some effects about changes in circulation, so local effects about changes in circulation. So all this add to local and global uncertainty 
but it shouldn't actually block decisions. I mean, decision makers are really used to make decisions under uncertainty, and you can make uh, sort of decisions in time that cover your next period, say 30 years, giving yourself an option for hiking your wall, for example, just to give a very uh, imaging example. And there, when the information becomes available, you can adapt your decision making for adaptation purposes. Um, the, just, I just want to dwell on your point about, uh, about uh, Venice, uh, I think. I mean, with 680 million people living within 10 meters of the sea level today, I mean, any city that does not at this point have an impact and adaptation uh, 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 study or research to, to just see what the implications are going to be for their city, better get on and do it because there is going to be humongous impacts in coastal area and you have to manage those impacts in the best way you can with the means that you have and get those means when they're not there. So I think Venice, I don't know what their status is in adaptation, but uh, certainly to have a look at this in the long term with the evidence that we have about sea level rise, about the other things that are happening with Venice sinking in particular and the way they're managing or not their environment would be really critical. Um, I think that we have uh, covered, uh, Jane, would you like to say a few words? Um, yeah, go ahead. Uh, yes, just uh, briefly, because I think it's largely been covered, but just on the point about um, carbon calculations and, and blue carbon, this is uh, obviously quite an issue that's uh, close to the overseas territories hearts as well. I think the general view was that um, yeah, just because you had water didn't mean that you should get out of this. Um, it actually makes me think about uh, one of the things I didn't think was particularly covered in the SROC was, was fire. Uh, and of course in Arctic, uh, fire is contributing quite a lot of carbon. So you've got the kind of the, the, the pluses and the minuses. And I think one of the questions really on the, on the blue economy um, is to get kind of as specific as we can get about what the actual benefit of not doing certain things or uh, reseeding or coral or whatever it is, um, kind of what actually does that mean? Uh, because I think if we ignore the oceans, um, then collectively, then we're all going to be pushed for even more kind of carbon reductions. On the international um, multilateral um, uh, organizations that you mentioned, uh, of course, there, there isn't one currently for the high seas. Uh, there it is under discussion in the United Nations. Um, so, uh, yes, CBD is in China next year, which is a good opportunity for trying to promote marine protection issues, but that technically is only under national jurisdiction, so the ocean discussion in the, in the United Nations is equally as key there, um, but I'm not sure that they're looking at it from a kind of science perspective, to be honest. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of Venice, uh, I think I would agree. Uh, also, uh, I think they just need to get on and finish their flood defense thing and probably build it a bit higher. Um, in terms of the locked-in carbon, I'm not going to answer that from a science point of view, but, but one of the very interesting things in the, in the polar um, world is the extent to which you meet tipping points. So irrespective of how much you've kind of locked in of your carbon, uh, we are on a trajectory where quite likely the West Antarctic ice sheet is going to collapse. Um, we need to work out when. Uh, and so there's a huge amount of money being spent by the UK and the US in particular to look at the rate of um, collapsing of the Thwaites Glacier, which basically is draining the West Antarctic. Uh, and of course, once that's gone, uh, it, irrespective of, of how much carbon kind of your balance is at that point, it's not going to regrow. So you're losing things at kind of a step loss, the same with kind of permafrost in the Arctic. And I think that, to me, is, is almost a more interesting question than kind of how much carbon's locked in, because once these things trigger, they, they won't come back in the current kind of any kind of trajectory of, of humans on the planet. Thanks. Can I just uh, follow on one of your very early comments about governance? Um, you know, politicians do declaration in G7, G20 about climate change, about the state of the ocean last year. I mean, are these useful? Are these really helping to sort of keep everybody focused and on board? I mean, to an extent. You, I mean, you would obviously argue all day about how much more rapidly you'd like things to change. But I think without having it on the agenda, the UK and the US wouldn't be, for example, investing upwards of 10 million pounds on trying to look at the rate of collapse of Thwaites Glacier. So if it wasn't on the agenda, then mm. a lot of things that are happening wouldn't happen at all. Thank you. We'll do another round of uh, comments. Uh, Yet yeah, there's one here in the front. Uh, 
sorry, it's me again. Um, it, it seems so strange to be hearing uh, this report. Um, and, and thank you so much, all the scientists in the room who have dedicated their lives to doing this incredibly important work. But why is it not actually reacted to by government policy? It seems strange that we're not in a national emergency here and that there isn't a Manhattan-style project to respond to well, the, the facts I'm hearing. Thank you. Any other points? I do want to bring on the table the risk to health, uh, probably particularly to Melanie here. I mean, there are indications of risk to health and risk to, in fact, industry as well, especially in this Royal Society report where it was brought back in. If you could just say a bit, uh, is this big? Is this uh, in the forefront? Um, do we know how bad it's going to get? Are we doing something about it? Uh, both I'm thinking about uh, food poisoning in particular and maybe uh, blockage of power plants in the industry that have been uh, identified sporadically but uh, still with potential big impact. I'm actually babbling here trying to sort of encourage the room to come up with more points. <laughs> Any, anything else? Yeah, thank you. Um, Belinda Howe from Decarbonize. Uh, also interested in shipping emissions. I believe those are beginning to come in, um, but perhaps we need more. In which angle? Did you have a specific angle for, no, just in general shipping emissions? Um, I suppose not simply linked to, to climate change, but also more general pollution, but obviously for yeah. this report focusing on climate change. Yeah. Joe, and there's, oh yeah, I'll come to you in a minute. Hi, thanks, Corinne. Um, sorry, it's not exactly a question, but just come back to the point that was raised by the panel about IPBES and IPCC. So they have announced to do a joint technical paper on biodiversity and climate change. It's their first joint piece of work, long time coming. Hopefully there'll be lots more of that. Thank you. Yeah, in the back, yeah. Hi. Thank you. It feels like there's quite a disconnect when we're talking about food security. Um, if we're looking at agriculture and fisheries and aquaculture in quite separate uh, in quite separate ways. So, for example, in the new climate change risk assessment, will you be considering how the public perception of uh, their the public perception of carbon footprint of their food will be impacting? impacting aquaculture. For example, I know quite a few people who have sworn off meat, so they're now swapping all of that out for fish, and how is that going to affect our industry? Mm. Thank you. There's one here. Yeah. Um, you were talking about how important it is to build um, flood defences for cities at risk of flooding, um, but how is the um, Committee on Climate Change advising the government about new builds in floodplains, which is something that we're dealing with locally? Okay. Uh, who would like to start? Okay. Um, well, maybe I should kick off because um, what, what Corinne was, was, was tactfully doing was reminding me about various things that I should have said earlier. Um, <laughs> <laughs> which is very diplomatic. Um, so, yeah, I mean, the, the report, and I don't think anybody really touched on it earlier, does, does mention that as we uh, move forward, you know, if you haven't heard enough doom and gloom already, basically there's, there's likely to be an increase in harmful algal blooms uh, as, as, as climate change takes effect, and also potentially increases in pathogens like Vibrio. Um, and those are likely to be sort of more experienced, if you like, uh, from seafood consumption, and which again relates to the sort of whole aquaculture thing and the food security uh, issue. So actually there's, there's always, with marine, there's always something that you can say, and this relates to that, and that relates to that. Um, and, and as we heard this morning, food systems and food security are, are very closely linked as well. Um, 
the power plants one is, is again, we're seeing um, increasing, and we have been for some time, increasing outbreaks of jellyfish blooms. Most power plants are, uh, not most, but the ones that are coastally situated have water intakes to, for cooling water, um, and those get blocked by the large outbreaks of jellyfish. Um, and then there has to be quite a lot of effort to, to, to unblock them and it shuts the power plants down, etc. So there are sort of industry threats there. Um, I think more difficult is, is we can sort of signpost that these things are coming. We can put better monitoring systems in place. And uh, I certainly know aquaculture industry, uh, people who are engaged in the aquaculture industry who would love for better monitoring systems to go in place because they're not very happy with the ones that they have in place at the moment. They don't think they're good enough. Um, so they would like to see more monitoring. And I think you know that is one of those adaptations we're going to need is we're going to have to look at our food quality from the sea more carefully um, and whether it's, it's fit for human consumption. Um, which then again, as, as you alluded to, well, if everybody's switching from uh, not eating meat to eating seafood, uh, what, what are the consequences of that? And um, I'm not sure, I, I don't think we, we are, I think you're right, we aren't really looking at the carbon footprint of aquaculture. Uh, but I think we also said this morning that we're not really looking at the carbon footprint of, of our food supply particularly efficiently or effectively at the moment anyway. Um, so we need to do more of that so that we can give people the choices about what, what food they do eat and, and what's the right food to eat. Um, you know, as, as an aside, you know, it, it, I worry about, you know, substitution of, of one type of uh, of, of, of dairy milk for, for other products that, that are shipped in from halfway across the world, um, sort of for soy milk or almond milk or whatever. So, you know, there's, there's always going to be trade-offs, and the only way people can, can deal with those trade-offs is if they're informed about them. Um, so, yes, I think we, we need to, to be aware that we're going to have to, to look out for our food systems better um, and, and, and just, yeah, be better informed about what we need to look out for and when we need to look out for it and put the systems in place, um, which sort of, again, um, kind of comes to the sea level rise. Is it 30 years? Is it, is it 100 years? But at least if we know it's coming, then we can start to put the systems in place now rather than waiting until we see lots of people getting pathogens from seafood or from consumption or from bathing in seawater um, so that they can take, so we can actually monitor for that now. Yeah, Andrew, maybe? Yes, so on the uh, new built on floodplains, I mean, the, the, the numbers don't look good. It's in the order of, what, ten to 20,000 properties a year that are going into flood zone three. Um, it's not necessarily a massive problem. Some of those will be behind flood defences, so anything built in London essentially will uh, fall into those statistics, but it, it's going to be very well protected. Um, beyond that, I think if if we toughen up the rules, the building regulations and the, 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 PP, the planning, PPG, whatever that stands for, um, the, the rules related to property level flood resilience and sustainable drainage systems, if we can beef those up, then I, I, I think that problem can be managed. Um, it, it's still building up exposure, but um, yeah, the, what the alternatives are, uh, are not, um, is not an easy solution either. Uh, on the first question, I mean, I, I don't know why there's not so much action. I mean, thinking specifically about climate change adaptation, I suppose at the moment there's a lot of momentum with net zero and XR and um, all the climate emergencies that are being declared um, on the mitigation side, so reducing the emissions. But, you know, I'm slightly worried that the, the adaptation side of this story is, is being left behind um, at the moment, certainly. And I hope that that we can come up with ways of looking at mitigation and adaptation approaches that have co-benefits and they can be built together and that we can properly assess the benefits of um, the, the interventions that we're going to be uh, um, implementing over the next uh, years, decades to try and tackle this problem um, more broadly. On uh, public perception and or public action on food and diet, I mean, has, has Andy Challoner gone? Because he's leading the CCRA chapter on. Um, oh, okay, yeah, I'm not sure what's happening there, but but I know we are doing some work on 
um, public actions. Oh, do you know Richard? Good. Uh, yes, I'm uh, Richard Betts. Yeah, I'm yeah. Uh, from the Met Office, Hadley Centre and University of Exeter. I'm, I'm leading the writing of the technical chapters for this third CCRA. So the question was about cha implications of changes in diet, wasn't it? That's not really in scope of the climate change risk assessment as such, because that's about assessing the risk of climate change. Although where the, the net zero agenda comes in is the interactions between uh, mitigation and climate change impacts and adaptation. So I think dietary things specifically is not really in scope, but lots of other things and uh, how they relate to climate change impacts are in scope. Yeah, Jane. Uh, thank you. It's useful to go last because I can pick which ones I'll answer. Um, on the, on the, the, the kind of why aren't people taking action, um, obviously we're in Perda, so I'm not going to get political. It's a very political question, but I will give you two examples from the overseas territories. Um, one is uh, the discussion that the Falkland Islands has had about whether or not they will pursue their hydrocarbon drilling. Uh, they've had several public meetings about it, and of course they are pursuing it. Um, and they're, they're balanced, you know, you're thinking about do you, as an individual uh, with shares in the hydrocarbons industry, wish to pursue this for an economic outcome, uh, or should we leave it in the ground and, you know, it might do the planet some good? Well, you know which way that one went. Uh, the, the Cayman Islands is having a referendum uh, currently about whether or not they will build a new tourism infrastructure coastal area or whether they'll leave their mangroves. Uh, and again, so I, th I, I do think economics is one of the real drivers. And who's responsible in terms of the, the, the individual uh, in these circumstances, individuals have some interest. Who's going to pick up the pieces if the worst happens? Maybe the government. And so the, the economics aren't balanced between kind of cause and effect. Uh, so I do think economics is probably the biggest driver. Uh, and then just on shipping, because no one else has mentioned that. Um, in the Antarctic, uh, heavy, the use of heavy fuel oil is banned uh, in, all, in all shipping. Um, and actually this last month, we've had the first sort of hybrid cruise ship go down. Uh, so the technology on reducing ship emissions is coming on because of the pressure that they're getting from the International Maritime Organization. Of course, they haven't banned heavy fuel oil yet in the Arctic because you're extracting it. So once you're taking it out of the ground, you've got it on a ship, so it's more challenging. But there is a big focus in the Arctic on black carbon because, of course, when you burn inefficiently, which ships tend to do, then you end up with black carbon. So there is quite a lot of pressure in the International Maritime Organization to address um, ship emissions. So it is... Um, a topical point. Thanks. Thank you. So before I open again for just a few uh, points before um, the break, I do want to just say a few words about your uh, question about the emergency. I mean, I wonder just exactly the same. I mean, the, w how many IPCC reports do you need? Uh, this is uh, it, it, what we're seeing now is that, I mean, for all my life of maybe 25 more years studying climate change science, I've kind of sort of battled the skeptical side of climate science, so people who didn't believe or didn't think it was important or anything. And now we have, we have a voice rising on the other side that says, you know, all the Extinction Rebellion and the Youth for Friday strikes and so on. And this voice is rising because there's an, this incredible void in action in the middle. I mean, we're battling all kinds of fronts and there is still not really proportionate action. Uh, I should say that there is action. It's not that there isn't action, but the action is not at the scale needed to really resolve the problem. Uh, we should not under, I mean, I, we are not underestimating the difficulty that this is, but I just want to stress that this is actually a very difficult problem, although that there has been a lot of um, support for climate action in the past year, incredible amount of support. There's also been quite a lot of pushback for actions like the Yellow Jackets in France, like the Netherlands farmers who went in the street with their trucks to protest against measure in agriculture. In Ecuador, there was also protests for removal of fossil fuel subsidies. And that's because we live in a society where fossil fuels are really part of all the dimension of society. And as soon as you change this, you also change the social balance. You also have impacts and inequalities in some cases that you're making worse with some of the actions. So that's why, in part, this transition needs to be fair 
because unless you bring all these people on board that are going to be affected, this was one of the points made uh, this morning about the implications for farmers, the implications for the fisheries, the implications for the business, for people, for health. All these have to be managed at the same time as you make action to move your society. So it is a big, big task, but at the same time, it would be also nice that things start to move forward. Uh, any points? We have a, you know, just a few minutes for a quick round. Yep, one here and one in the back there. Thank you. The um, question really mostly to Jane Rumble, I think. Um, that is, um, although we may, as liberal Western democracies, get our climate uh, under control, three quarters of the world's population lives in what are effectively despotic regimes where the, the antics of exile are not going to be well received. So how and what kind of leadership is the UK showing towards these kind of regimes? What kind of planning is there for the future? There's a second question in the back. Yeah, hi. Um, so my question kind of goes back to the idea of natural capital and in other areas of climate change action, especially for coal, it's been very, one of the strategies that have been very effective has been the famous co-benefits and uh, linking climate change to health and showing um, how you can, if you, if you do action on climate change, you can also improve other areas of life. Um, so I'm wondering in terms of communicating um, this science and, and these new findings that we have around the cryosphere and the ocean, whether we've all, we're also thinking through how to uh, communicate co-benefits of action um, on those areas. Thank you. Thank you. Anything else? There's room for one more before I ask the speakers to just respond and maybe say your final points. Okay. Okay. Who wants to start? Andrew, maybe this time? Uh, thank you for my direct question. Um, I think on the positive side, I think uh, everybody, pretty much everyone except one famously, um, have signed up to the Paris Agreement. So I think from that perspective, uh, it's, uh, um, there is a positive indication that despite kind of failures in other senses, there is a global understanding that, that we need to do something about uh, what's happening on climate. Um, I'm kind of limited about what I can say about where we go from here because uh, obviously we're in election herder. Uh, however, it is a fact that the UK is going to host uh, the COP next year, um, which will be hosted in Glasgow in December. Um, and that's going to be pretty significant. So um, my personal, and this is very much my personal hope, um, is that when we stop talking about that word beginning with B, uh, we might uh, get climate as the next priority for the Foreign Service. Uh, in discussions with different countries in order to prepare for the COP. So that's what I would like. Thank you. Um, yeah, so on this communication question, I mean, I, I don't have much to say at the moment, but we, we are working with um, Cardiff University who are running a climate resilience project looking at uh, how people um, rank climate risks and um, respond to... Uh, adaptation responses to those risks so I think that that project is going to be finished and uh, the, the report launched early next year so there should be some good guidance there on how to try and engage people more in um, uh, climate change, re climate resilience and co-benefits of, of different responses um, The co-benefits one is, is actually a really good sort of I think it's, it's an important point that you've made, um, so it's so a nice one. I tend to sort of always think of trade-offs, so, and, and in the marine environment, I'm afraid a lot of the time that's, that's fisheries versus pretty much everything else. And actually, you've reminded me that it's not fisheries versus everything else, it's actually everything else working in concert it gives us so many more benefits, potentially, economically, socially, health-wise, than always Alluded, you know, always prioritizing fishing. Um, so the example there might be um, that if we have protected areas where we are maybe encouraging 
uh, let's, let's take a whole system approach, uh, a, a coastal system that has salt marshes that are locking away carbon, that encourage uh, wetland birds, coastal birds, people can go and watch those, uh, people can go kayaking, sailing, and can go wandering in those places, so they get health and well-being benefits from the leisure of the recreation, there's an economic benefit from the tourism. To me, those are the sort of co-benefits that we don't refer to enough that in protecting the marine environment and protecting bits of it, we actually do get a lot of co-benefits. Um, and we need to make more of those. And, you know, one of those, just, just to highlight, just to keep going on uh, about some of those economic benefits, tourism, leisure and recreation is, in this country, you know, potentially a lot more valuable than the food production sector in the marine environment. Um, and yet you don't hear many people saying, you know, we ought to do a lot more to improve leisure and recreation for the people um, in the UK. On the other side of that, I do work a lot uh, with developing countries, and, and it feels kind of quite trivial to talk about leisure and recreation uh, and tourism in those countries where food security is really the issue. So I, I sort of sit with two kind of slightly different hats when I think about, you know, the UK, the develop, you know, sort of Western Europe, etc. And then I go into Southeast Asia, where actually we've really got to try and make sure that people have food on the table. And that then starts to become a trade-off. The tourism can be good uh, in terms of some sort of economic income, but a lot of our economic income doesn't go to the people who need to put food on their table. It goes to some other people elsewhere, up country, in a different place. At the same time, those people in those local communities get a massive welfare, well-being benefit out of being proud of their environment, looking after their environment, taking some you know, personal responsibility for their environment. So that's, that's the co-benefit we also have to not lose sight of, that those health and well-being benefits aren't just about uh, you know, us in our privileged sort of Western world, but also for some of those people in those developing countries, in those coastal communities. So there aren't any easy answers, but I think co-benefits is, is, is a good way to think about things and to frame things as well as thinking about the trade-offs. Okay, thank you. Uh, just a few words um, to say, I mean, these three IPCC reports that came in, two, in the middle of a cycle uh, were very useful in my view. Uh, we, I think that we are not at a standstill. In fact, although we don't uh, have the emergency response that you were asking here earlier, uh, we do have uh, all the technology and most of the know-how that we need to act on climate change, both for the adaptation and the mitigation side. I'm, I'm, I'm reassured by the fact that uh, climate change has come up in the front line of the, the media and the mind of the people, and particularly, I think the value of the environment is a lot higher now than it used to be even just a few years ago. But we need to acknowledge there will be ups and downs, and it should not stop uh, more coordination and action both within governments and between governments and a fair and well-prepared uh, transition. Uh, thank you. The, we now have a half hour break and then will be the session around, uh, let me read this properly, taking action on evidence, the three IPCC special reports taken together. Okay? Okay. Thank you. Thank you.